Hi, this is your host Sapnil Bhartia and welcome to T3M, our topic of this month. And the topic of this month is data. And today we have with us Martin Fan, field CTO at Cloud Casa by Catalogic. Now, Martin, it's great to have you back on the show. Great to be back. Thanks, Sapnil. And today we are going to talk about namespace as service and what are the, some of the data challenges that it solves? So, so talk a bit about from Cloud Casa's perspective. To consider namespace as a service, you have to understand a little bit about Kubernetes and, and software as a service in general, right? Um, so with Kubernetes, uh, we have this ability to spin up applications pretty much with a, a click of a button or like a declarative one-line command statement. Um, and as users are spinning up these services, they are hosting these services within clusters. And... Uh, Part of the reason why namespace as a service has become so prevalent is because users don't really want to deploy multiple clusters for each application or service that they're looking to host within their uh, website or w within, let's say, their application. So um, what namespace as a service entails uh, entails is the, the fact that you want to subdivide that Kubernetes cluster even further, right? Users wanting to do more with less in other words, uh, for hosting their applications. So that's um, how we get we come to namespace as a service is to actually subdivide it and, and segregate the cluster, isolate the services within the cluster down to their individual namespaces such that you can secure that application within the namespace and only provide users that should have access with access to that service. How widely it's been used uh, within the Kubernetes ecosystem, what kind of awareness there, what kind of demand is there for, for it? I think it's still within its early phases, right? Uh, users are still uh, in the process of adopting Kubernetes, but just like we saw with, um, you know, I like to use it, the VMware and physical server analogy where uh, users wanting to do more with less have basically um, consolidated their applications or multiple operating systems onto one physical host, right? Um, and as users start to adopt Kubernetes more uh, and start hosting their services and their application pods within Kubernetes, uh, we're starting to see more of a, a shift towards that uh, software as a service application, um, at least cloud native applications running within a single cluster, there is limitations in terms to uh, how those applications can then be secured. So now we're starting to see the shift of uh, these ephemeral one-time workloads that are being hosted within Kubernetes uh, just spun up for, let's say, a matter of, uh, of days or weeks now becoming uh, more along the lines of monolithic applications, almost like a, a cloud cost. So we're hosting our own cloud cost application, as you know, within Kubernetes. Uh, it is a Kubernetes application. And we're now wanting to uh, segregate our environments such that they can run, uh, we can run multiple applications or, or services within a single cluster and then further protect those applications through namespace as a service. So the uh, I think while we're still in the early phases of uh, adoption here, I think this will become a very prevalent use case uh, moving forward in the future as users begin to adopt more Kubernetes workloads and, and um, look to secure those workloads within namespace as a service. Can you just specifically talk about what are the benefits of namespace as a service for Kubernetes backup and recovery? We're looking at it from a, a cost perspective, a, a data governance perspective, right? If you are, are backing up and protecting Kubernetes, right, and applications, if a user has access to a Kubernetes cluster, they basically have uh, access to uh, the, the control plane, the, the, the central database, the, the SCD database uh, that is uh, hosting the applications and, and has all the definitions for those applications. With Cloud Cost, we make it very easy to back up it and migrate and, and recover uh, namespaces and pods within Kubernetes. Um, and that ease could uh, provide some malicious actor the ability to come in and, and back up, let's say, an application and restore to a cluster, uh, a, a entirely separate cluster, right? Just by the mere fact that they have access to the main cluster, they have access to all the underlying applications underneath it, right? So with uh, Namespace as a service, what we're doing in our partnership with Classics and their module Capsule is we are allowing for tenancies to be created within the cluster. That is the ability to uh, segregate that cluster even further so that um, 
users will only have access to specific namespaces within that cluster. And Cloud Casa will then, uh, through its own role-based access control, filter down those namespaces down to their own component levels and uh, ensure that the Cloud Casa user that's trying to perform a backup or recovery of the pod or, or namespace within the cluster actually has access to that namespace. If we look at just backup and recovery space, uh, can you draw a contrast from the traditional or you know on-prem experience versus cloud native or Kubernetes experience and how you folks, or specifically if you look at namespace as a service, help users uh, protect their data? That's a great question. So, um, it, it, I, and I'm gonna answer it, uh, just basically speaking in in terms of, of cloud native applications and, and Kubernetes backups, because uh, we, as you know, the uh, Cloud Casa, um, which was spun off from Catalogic Software, we also have a, a data protection um, application, uh, DPX and DPXV plus, uh, among others that, uh, actually protect uh, on-prem, your, your traditional backup and recovery, as, as you mentioned, right, um, with agents. And with Kubernetes and cloud native applications, that completely changed the paradigm uh, from how we protect these uh, cloud native workload states. Uh, the beauty of Cloud Casa is that we are cloud aware. We integrate natively with the cloud. So, um, and I'm talking uh, you know, some of the big three cloud providers, uh, Amazon, uh, Microsoft, Google, right? We integrate and have native integration directly into those clouds to perform discovery and actually build clusters uh, with a click of a button uh, on the fly, something that we call uh, full stack recovery or any to cloud recovery. And, and that's a really cool feature that we have uh, from a uh, native integration standpoint, but um, from an on-prem, off-prem, you know, where the cluster is located from a Kubernetes perspective, it really doesn't matter to us, right? From a, a cloud cost perspective, right? Um, in the fact that the agent that uh, is deployed is a similar manifest file um, uh, or, or the same manifest file actually between uh, deploying on a cloud or, or uh, the uh, an on-prem resource. That agent is going to do the exact same thing as it would do uh, within the cloud and possibly more, right? So we're collecting the underlying metadata. We're uh, interrogating uh, the, the cluster itself. We are... Um, and from a cloud perspective, we're, we're interrogating the actual cloud APIs as well. What type of backend storage, for example, what storage classes are made available to that cluster. And now with this integration and uh, with a classics and capsule to provide us with that granular level of focus, uh, namespace as a service, right? We're going to be able to filter uh, even further and subdivide even further such that users who, let's say, want as they're growing their Kubernetes uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, but consolidating applications into, let's say, one large cluster with many worker nodes, they're now able to subdivide each and every single namespace down uh, and then just provide access to those users. The The, the best part is, is that the, the end user really has no, um, no knowledge of the fact that the uh, the, the, the namespaces are being filtered. They just see what they see, they can back up what they can back up and they can restore what they can restore. And that's really the beauty of it. Do uh, teams need a different approach uh, when they want to uh, leverage namespace service or it really doesn't affect their own workflow? The aspect of, of the ad administrator, um, the, the Kubernetes administrator, they're going to require some setup. It's an additional uh, pod. Uh, the, so they're going to need to install the uh, class six capsule module uh, to their cluster. But then uh, from once installed, they're going to be able to create rules and access permissions uh, within that cluster that will then be reported back to the Cloud Casa server. And, and that's kind of the integration that we have with, with, with class six capsule module is they have an add-on component that basically mirrors the rules and permissions back to Cloud Casa. Cloud Casa does the rest in terms of uh, filtering out those namespaces that that user should only see. And then because that user can only see uh, certain namespaces and certain pods, they're going to be able to only they're only going to be able to access and back up and restore those those namespaces and pods. So uh, from a, the the end user perspective, you're not the the Kubernetes cluster administrator, you're not the the, the data protection administrator. You're not going to experience any 
change or, or, or uh, uh, change to your workflow or change to your um, infrastructure that you're going to be aware of or that you'll need to know about. You'll just be defining packs and restores just as you normally would. And that's how we designed it. Martin, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about this topic. And as usual, I would love to chat with you again. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me again, Swati.